Good morning and welcome. Um, I'm Kate Bulkley. I was waiting for the 50 years of MIP sting, but I guess they're not going to run it. But it is the 50th anniversary of MIP, so that's very good, right? <laughs> Thank you all for coming uh, this morning. I'm glad you're awake. Um, as I said, I, yeah, I hope you're awake. As I said, I'm Kate Bulkley. I'm a media commentator based in the UK, and I'm here to run this morning's uh, session. We have two in a row. We're going to start with um, a look a little bit more at the numbers that matter one to one. Um, digital media means a lot of data, and those of us who've been in this industry know that data is becoming more and more talked about, more and more controversial. There's a lot of fights about it. Uh, who has the data? How do we use the data? Who controls the data? If you just look at what happened uh, yesterday with the European Commission, they obviously are talking to Google about how they use their data and their search. So this is a very interesting topic. It's quite a rich topic. And what we're going to start with is a look uh, specifically at what's going on with uh, data and advertising and how we actually distill the numbers down to the numbers that matter most. As we say in our headlines, it's the consumer and the advertiser. So we, have, we don't have Scott Ferber because, unf unfortunately, he had to uh, decline yesterday because of some uh, personal issues at home. But we do have Ryan Jamboretz, and he is the International Managing Director of Videology. He's been at Videology for about four years. Um, he is their international MD. He's also one of the co-founders, so he knows a lot about this. Um, he, has, he lives in the UK. He actually has led the successful launch of Videology in the UK, Ireland, France, Spain, Italy, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Australia. So he also has a lot of air miles. So we can talk to him about that. Uh, he, um, before joining Videology, and he's going to tell you more about what they do, but he was head of corporate development for Group M, which is, of course, part of WPP. So this is a man who has actually been inside of the advertising business in a big way. So I think he will give us some interesting insights into how we should be looking at data and how we uh, talk about that in terms of consumers and also your view, which is you know, how we actually monetize the content that we have out there. So could you please welcome Ryan Jamboretz. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for having me. Um, as uh, Kate said, we're here to talk about uh, addressability today and the, the idea of how do you connect with consumers. And, and given some of my history and the, the history of our company, um, we spent a lot of time working on how does content get monetized, um, largely and in, in for the initial part of our company from the advertising perspective, working for the big agency holding companies around the world, my former employer at WPP as well as others. Um, you know, it, it begs the question and it gets us into what is addressability, why does it matter, and, and, and for content creation and distribution, why is it important? Um, if I can do one thing today, it's going to be to come back to the question of, as content creators, how does monetization improve? How do you start to tackle monetization in a world where every cliched comment about fragmentation has is, is been brought up, every number to detail how much consumption is happening on tablets or on mobile, away from traditional channels, um, is something you know all too well. So we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about how the power of technology and data actually brings that back together. So addressability is really the concept of coming one-to-one -one with consumers. How do you actually put the right content in front of the right consumer at the right time? It's the exact same problem that the advertisers face in terms of putting the right ad in front of the right person at the right time. It seems like a very simple concept. Begs the question, why is it so hard? The truth is, it, it's always been a very singular thing. I mean, we see today is the, or this week is the 50th anniversary of MIP TV. This year is also the 65th anniversary of the US television upfront. The time every year when big brands, Procter & Gamble, General Motors, Unilever, go into the TV upfronts in the US and purchase content and agree to deals that they're gonna put their brands into throughout the year. This is the way it's always been done. And as content creators, monetizing your your craft, your product, has always been largely dependent upon those big trading seasons every year where the advertisers show up with their money and learn to spend. That was really easy when it was one to many, when you had broadcast television that went out in prime time and reached the large audience across the country. That's become extremely difficult when you start to get into the many to one scenario we face today. Today you have a lot of devices. You have devices of every kind which are in, in large part disintermediating a lot of the traditional media types that we knew. You only need to think about the classified business, the radio business, the newspaper business to understand that technology has been largely a net negative if you're a content creator. 
It hasn't been something that has improved the monetization of your content. In many ways, it seems to leakage outside of the places where you're getting paid for your content. And the one thing that I'm here to talk about today is the work that we do at Videology. And as my name, the name of our company implies, we work in the video space. We work in the brand, brand advertising space. We work in the television space. A lot of what we're doing with technology builds off of the television world. It adopts the same metrics, the same norms. We're oftentimes reallocating spending from big TV budgets into these new devices where your content lives. And, and the news I would share with you guys is, I actually think as it relates to video, the dynamic is extremely different. It is actually a really positive situation. Um, high quality content in the video space is in massive demand. There isn't enough of it. You only need to look as far as the investments that companies like Google have made, AOL have made, Yahoo have made, traditional digital companies into producing content. I mean, the simple fact that YouTube is giving a keynote at MIP TV um, four years after they were you know, in the basement um, says a lot. And it says a lot that they are becoming the new mechanisms. And you guys are seeing this, whether it's Netflix with House of Cards or any of these great pieces of content which are finding new ways to consumers. Whether it's a subscription model or it's an advertising model or, or as we hypothesize, probably a blend of the both, um, there are a lot of new ways. And, and, and what I hope to do, if anything, today is communicate to you a little learning we've taken from how people spend their money so that you can learn how to capture those dollars in the greatest way. So as I said earlier, the, the world's expanding, right? The, the television world is expanding. And if you look at consumption of, of radio, if you look at consumption of newspapers, it's a pretty scary picture. If you look at the consumption of television, it's actually very positive. Consumption of TV has gone up year on year. When the economic downturns of 2008, 9, and 10 hit, television consumption went up, and it's continued to go up. One of the more interesting facts I've heard recently is from our big investor, Comcast. They are a big supporter of us as a company. They're obviously on NBC Universal as well. They did some research recently. Research was actually done by CBS as well, which corroborates this, that if you're a television viewer and you're also a consumer of video content on another device, a tablet or a mobile device or a connected television, you actually consume more TV. So if you're consuming on multiple devices, that original device, that television, you consume more than a person who just watches television. It was a big learning for these guys because the scary territory of the world disintegrating before their eyes, viewership spreading out to all these places where they felt largely out of control, actually was helping build their core business. So the television business today, it's good. It's really good. These guys are trying to find ways to reach consumers in a lot of places, and that's where as you guys are developing content and distributing it in many different ways, the help is needed. So how consumers, or how brands spend their money and how content creators monetize their content, it's not easy, it's complex, and there are a lot of approaches to it. This chart on the left actually shows the video space that iCompany lives in up in the top. That is one chart which deals with just how many players and solutions and integrations and intermediaries there are. You know, you'll hear a lot about aggregators. You'll hear a lot about people who say, I can make the world really easy for you. I can make it really complex, uh, really complex and make it very simple for you. That's just one market. Start looking at the mobile space. Start looking at how your work gets pushed out into social and it gets even more complex. It's the reason for companies like ours. It's the reason that companies have become, without describing it in a too basic way, systems integrators. Companies that come in and work with people around the industry and make things easier for you as an advertiser or as a content creator or distributor to monetize. How do you simplify what is an insanely complex world? The tough thing about this market, the tough thing about the TV and the video market is all of that complexity leads to one big problem. It's the problem that you hear a lot of speeches about these days, fragmentation. It's the idea that the people that I, could use, I used to be able to find by putting a television ad at 8 p.m. on Saturday night across the entire country, whatever country that might be, just don't exist anymore. People are watching it on PCs. People are watching it on IP-based devices. So how do you deal with fragmentation? The idea used to be if you were a brand and you wanted to launch a product like bottled water, you would do what my, uh, my, my old boss at uh, Group M used to call the double hop. You would say, I want to sell bottled water and I'm gonna sell it to women 18 to 34. Where am I most likely to find women 18 to 34? And you would pick a series of, I'm gonna be incredibly cliche here, a series of soap operas. 
and you would run ads for your bottled water on the anticipation that those women would show up and watch that ad and buy that water. As the world is fragmented, that's become hard to do at scale. You can no longer run one ad and reach 80% of the country. You can no longer put your content in front of you know, one device and reach 80% of the consumption. So what do you do? This is where we come in. This is where people like us come in and, and use things like data. We're using data to find audiences. And really what that means is finding out who the real consumer is in real time, not waiting till several weeks after that water ad is run to find out who was watching that, but in milliseconds actually identifying this is a woman 18 to 34 in a specific geography and a specific income bracket, and they're the best person to receive this ad. It's a way to make the media monetization business much more efficient. It's a misnomer that digital media has made the world um, completely efficient. Analog media, as it once was, was incredibly inefficient, but it worked. It was really wasteful, but everyone saw that Procter & Gamble and automotive companies had built up big brands by spending a lot of money. So there was, a, there was a, a kind of an acceptance of the waste, but an understanding that it worked. As you got into the digital media world, people really started to see how wasteful things were, even though it was better. What we do now is we actually ingest third-party data and do audience targeting. So it literally is knowing which audience is seeing that content at that point in time and putting the right messages in front of them. Whether that's an advertising message or whether that's a promo to see other content on that distributor or whether that is just distributing content. Knowing who your audience is not only helps the retention and the retention of messages, but the consumption of future content. So I've been talking a little bit about data and, and the way that we do audience targeting. Audience targeting is fueled through data. We hear a lot about big data these days and the amount of data. Just as an example, one of our average publishers, one of our big US-based publishers that we work with, collects in and around 4.5 terabyte, terabytes of data every day on the people that consume content on their devices. Just to, you know, to, I walk around with my little thumb drive, my one gig, thumb, uh, one gig thumb drive in my pocket all the time. 4,500 of those a day. In the, the general theme, if I was to talk about it, whether it's a Comcast and NBC or whether it's ABC or Tafun or ITV, these companies, generally speaking, the common theme is they don't leverage it. They don't use it. It is a massive collection of data that is underutilized. The people who are winning and the people who are monetizing their content most effectively are the people that are embracing that, processing that data, and then using it to fuel their monetization. 4.5 terabytes of data translates to about 20 billion targetable attributes about consumers in a given day. Three, per, three to four per person on the planet. And again, those companies out there who are using data, who are using it to find out who is really, truly watching their content are the ones who are winning. We were talking about before this presentation kind of some of the, um, the myths that are in the media world and people buy into. One of the biggest myths is literally that the people who watch content on television are the same people who watch it on digital devices. The fact is it's very untrue and it's actually very different, but it's been a myth that actually has helped the industry all along. And as these things become more transparent, as we have more knowledge about who's consuming your content, it's an opportunity because it's an opportunity to sell that content to new people who aren't being monetized today. Using big data, digesting data, and using it for learnings after the fact is a, is a hard thing. Using it in real time and understanding who is loading that content on their PC or on their iPhone or on their tablet is very difficult. As this rather creepy picture of this rather creepy boy shows, it's 20 milliseconds from when we see data make a decision, and show a piece of content. In that time, literally the blink of an eye, we have to understand who is there and what is the best piece of content or advertising to push back to them. That's how it works in the modern day, and that's how using data, you know, whether it's pushing a piece of content to one person on their mobile phone and another piece of content to them immediately after on their connected television, that's where companies like ours come into play. This is a quote that actually came from one of our publisher clients in the US. And, and it really comes down to our role as a systems integrator and in companies like ours, right? Which is the world has never been so complex. Um, I don't want to know more. I just need someone to kind of distill it down and help me make decisions more effectively. Really what it comes down to and where we kind of you know, focus our energies on is maximizing media value. And that's when we talk about how do you take some of these 
approaches and themes and monetization concepts that have been applied largely up till now um, in the first phases of this kind of development in the industry by the advertising holding companies, the big agencies who control all the money. It's now being adopted in the world of publishers. And it really is about maximizing media value. We talk about it. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's an oversimplification of many of the things we do, and our technologists will, will, will be quite negative for me saying this. But really what we do is make things less wasteful. We make a very wasteful media less wasteful, whether you're on the demand side of the equation or whether you're trying to monetize content from the publisher supply side. And how do we do it? There's really three ways. And this is, this is if I was to say, how do you go out and say, the three lessons I need to know about how I'm going to better monetize my content going forward. It's one, not just having data, but activating its use. Two, capitalizing on this convergence of devices we're talking about. And three, validating to ROI. This is a case study which comes from a, uh, one of our clients, publisher in the US, who I can't give by name, a uh, large music publisher who lives on uh, PC, mobile, even in cars, um, music subscription service. It shows the power of data. On the left side, this publisher had the ability to monetize their content by selling categories, country music, classical music, rock music, selling things about people, maybe even some of the geographies. What they found was advertisers, while they thought the content was very high quality, didn't like to buy advertising in that way. They, they targeted men 18 to 49, women who lived in the UK or France. Characteristics which this website didn't have. We went out and, and acquired third party data then brought it to the party with them and found out that instead of you know, country music fans, if you had the ability to go to advertisers and say, I have a huge pot of content that people come to very regularly, and I can show you women 18 to 49. I can show you women 18 to 49 who live in France. I can show you women 18 to 49 who live in Paris with a certain income. The value of that content for advertisers increases dramatically. It really comes down to the, 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 the notion of what I have needs to be put into the format of what they want to buy. And really, when you're talking about the big dollars and where the money comes from, it's how they want to spend television money, the biggest pot of media money out there. This isn't kind of large, esoteric, digital media concepts. This is, I'm advertising on TV, and I want to shift my money into these programs. The good thing is, pricing performance is driven by performance of campaigns. Just if you look to the far right, brand recall from one of our recent case studies was increased by 76% by actually applying these third-party data sources. So the question is, are, are, are advertisers going to pay 10x? If they can get a, a, a brand recall, which is 76% higher, probably. The second kind of key metric that to, in kind of learning to take away from how to monetize content better is that convergence is actually a very good thing. Multi-device is a good thing. Some recent research we did in the States. If people are watching 54, uh, TV only, 54% of them have increased brand recall. If you move to online only, it's 59%. Paired together, it's actually higher than all the, the two previous. So actually what we're finding is, not only back to my Comcast comments of earlier, people who watch on multiple devices are consuming more, they're actually engaged more as well. And the final point I'll touch on is just linking back to ROI. I said earlier about kind of TV being very wasteful but everyone accepted that it was wasteful because it worked. Unfortunately, there's never been a direct link to say how well it worked. Uh, I have a, an econometrics background, and my original work in, when I came out of university was working on how do you attribute advertising to sales. And what we learned, you can't really. Not until now. We spent the last four years trying to link back to data sources that allowed us to connect advertising on digital devices with actual sales in store. When I talk about actual sales in store, I'm talking about Cases of Procter & Gamble shampoo moving off shelves. I'm talking about sales in a quick service restaurant or in the case of some of our work, auto sales. So we've actually pa partnered with a number of data providers around the world. And just to give you three case study examples, Kantar, the company that in the US and the UK and a lot of markets around the world that owns all of your shopper loyalty card data, who, who manages those programs, we've actually worked with them to pair up advertising against store purchases. And it's given us and it's given advertisers a way to show there is a way to link back to your advertising spending to literally what was bought. As a content creator and a content producer, if you can produce that, if you are a, a, a big distributor of content in the US or any other market and you can show advertisers, I can show you that my content is more valuable at driving the sales of your product, 
you're going to be in a very good place. Same was done with retail around a fast food restaurant and finally uh, around automotive. And, and I think for us, the idea of kind of connecting online advertising to an automotive sale was almost hard to get our head around. But what we found more and more and with people like Chevrolet and Ford in the US is that as they can put metrics toward how they are actually moving product off of, off of lots, it actually gets them in a very different frame of mind about how they'll spend their money on high quality content. And the thing they find is high quality content does this a lot better than low quality content. And that's one of the things that I'll, I'll leave us with as we kind of finish this up is, if you were to pick up one theme about how video and how TV and how video content propagating across all these devices will impact you, I would stay very positive. As I said earlier, high quality content is in short supply. High quality content performs better than low quality content and right now, people are willing to pay an extreme premium for high quality content to bring brands like this to market. So ultimately, we talk about what addressability is, what marketing one-to-one -one is. It's about using data, using technology to basically make content more effective and more powerful for the brands and for the content creators. Great. Thank Thanks. you very much. Great. Come and uh, sit down with me, and we'll just ask do a couple of questions. I think what was really interesting, I mean, the takeaway for me is that, um, you know, as you said, high quality content works better than low quality content. And these, as we get more data and we have more understanding of exactly what people are watching where, right? They, the, you know, the brands and the advertisers say, ah, you know, we can see this. We want to go with the good stuff. We want to go with good content that's going to bring in the people that we're trying to talk to. And that's, you know, it's a real positive for this industry. Let me ask you a question. This industry knows a lot about Nielsen, they know a lot about Barb, they know about that kind, those kind of rating agencies. Now it seems that Nielsen's moving into uh, this, this, let's say, new, I don't even want to call it new world, the newer world, the more data efficient yeah. world, and they're starting to come up with what, the thing that they just launched. Uh, oh, OCR, yeah. The OCR, the online campaign uh, ratings. I mean, is that the kind of thing that's really putting, I mean, are we now starting to see the, 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 the merging of these two worlds? I, I think so. I mean, I think the, the thing that we, and this kind of gets back to the early thesis of when we started this company, which was, um, I think I mentioned this earlier, the, the, the onset of uh, advertising technology to, to most content has been a, largely a negative influence. Uh, it's devalued content. The one exception, and this is where we've been living and breathing, is, is how the video content world works and how it is being driven by 50 years of MTV and 65 years of US upfronts in terms of television behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the major, major um, behaviors and one of the criteria of television is that there was an understood metric. There was an understood currency. There was an understood guarantee against that currency in terms of how content creators sold their content or monetized their content. Until now, there hasn't been that same equivalent for digital devices. It's been a um, somewhat of a belief that it was working the same way as television with OCR and the development. And I would, I would actually describe to Nielsen's benefit, to their credit, it's one of the more interesting product launches that I've seen in the industry in, in kind of the, the last four or five years. It's gotten massive traction in the U.S. market. It is quickly spilling into the U.S. or the U.K. and France right now, and we're seeing it in Australia. We're even seeing it in Japan. It's only about six months old. Right? Yeah, uh, and it's and, and the reason is because I mean, if you think about it, just in, you know, in, in in kind of a, a very basic way, the people who are spending the lion's share of media money in the world are. They're spending it in television. Mm -hmm. I think the television market globally is $200 billion versus about $20 billion for the digital market. Right. So you're talking about the big pot of money. And those people have always struggled to really understand the digital world. Mm -hmm. It's kludgy. It's a world of you know, young computer hackers. It's not their right. comfort zone. This has given them, and when they have a apples to apples currency to say, I can take 5, 10, 20% of my television budget and shift it into these devices and know apples to apples what it's delivering for me. So we're going to start seeing more shift money uh, shifting uh, in, right? Uh, ma I, I, Definitely. Definitely. That's our anticipation. Because I mean, the broadcasters it's, are going to be put on notice by the advertisers. They're going to say, look, guys. It's, it's, a, it's a scary time. I mean, I, I will say this in, in all honesty. It's a scary time for um, broadcasters. Mm. Um, I, you know, we know this from, you know, our, our clients tend to be the big agency holding companies who go in and write big checks in the upfront. And this year, they're going in and saying, if we are going to shift money into these devices, then you will guarantee it. And we will use a third-party audit, and it will be a very credible one. It's called Nielsen. You may have heard of it. Um, and... Yeah, and from a publisher perspective, it's very scary because what it's, it, I, I think I've, I've described it before as kind of the, uh, the Wizard of Oz moment. It's the moment where the curtain gets pulled back and everyone's kind of standing there and everyone sees the reality of what's going on. And the reality is that 
the people they've been saying are watching this content on tablets and phones and PCs are not the people who are actually watching it. And they're gonna have to live up to guarantees and that, you know, how they do that um, with a very finite, limited amount of high quality content, it's gonna cause some problems. That's interesting. And what does that mean for content makers when they start ta thinking about things? Should they be now going more direct to these devices as opposed to, and can they start thinking about selling to the digital world and maybe not even going through the broadcaster because they can actually figure out how to get the money or, or not? I mean, I kind of feel like aggregation and distribution are businesses that, that are probably the first to suffer, right? I mean, if we go back to the examples I was giving about newspapers or, or, or classifieds, I mean, I think those are, those are some of the things. Distribution is, is probably the one aspect of the TV and the video business I think is ripe for disruption. Mm -hmm. You know, there are, there are ways. I mean, I just, I look at the, the, the progress, people like Netflix or um, even the work that YouTube's done to kind of produce content, distribute mm -hmm. content, and, and how much more of overall consumption that is, is making up. There was an article, a cover story in the, the, the New York Times yesterday just about, you know, the progression of cord cutting in the U.S., mm -hmm. and, and this is becoming a big thing. So I think that is possible. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that will become, for a company like ours, um, a great thing, because the more distribution happens, the more content gets freed up, high quality content, not, you know, as I say, dogs on skateboards. Um, it's great for us. It's, yeah. it, it helps unleash our growth. Right, um, right. Because you can then say to them, okay, we'll take this content, and your clients who are the big advertisers and the agencies and the WPPs, those kind of people, say, hey, yeah, we want to we wanna use that content and target these people. And yeah, so, so simply, they, they can't spend enough of their money right now. Because There's not enough place to spend their money on high-quality content. There are ways to, to increase that distribution. It's a great thing. Right. Um, there, I think the other, you know, there's a part of it which is aggregation plays a role. There are always aggregators, especially in early markets, any kind of market, mm -hmm. there are aggregators. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and those play a very important part of the early development of an industry. And you can definitely see right now in the digital world that aggregation play is starting to crumble a little bit. Right, right. Um, I, I know we're running out of time, but if, if we turn the lights up, does anyone have a question for Ryan? or not, um, if we can have the lights down or up or something so I can see, I can't see anything. Does anyone have a question? In the front. In the front, yes? Sorry, I can see the hand. Sorry, I'm looking to, yes, who Hi. are you, sorry. Um, Frank. Uh, from, Hi, Frank. From Ex Machina. Hi. Um, you were showing something about ROI on the advertising, like 600, 700%. Um, what kind of ROI metrics do you mean there? What type of ROI? Are, what kind of ROI metrics do you mean there? In other words, how sales, sales, sales. Okay, sales. so, okay, so um, if I spend one hundred, I get seven hundred in sales. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. It's it, it, this is the thing. The um, ROI metrics have have in the digital world. ROI metrics, especially in the display and the search world, are, are very commonplace. In the analog, large broadcast, large advertiser world, they've never been achievable because linking up something to the offline distribution source where they actually sell their products, whether that's a car lot or whether that's a Tesco, um, has never been possible. We spent four years kind of cracking how to marry up those data sources to be able to see that. And now they can. You, and if you compare that to online, then what is, um, do you see that this is now as effective as uh, pure online spendings? Well, it's, it, it, it's some of an apples to orange question. I mean, the truth is, I mean, when you, we talk about, and, and you would describe what we're doing with this advertising money as being online. I mean, it is PC, uh, tablet, phone, connected television. So it's, it's taking television money and shifting it into online environments. Um, I think the comparison maybe you're suggesting is like, what if it were performance-based advertising online? Um, again, since these are predominantly brand advertisers, it's always been a little hard to kind of do an apples. Comparing um, Procter & Gamble to uh, somebody seeking a quote for insurance, it, it's a rel relatively hard comparison. Largely speaking, the people who are advertising with us are big multinational brands. Um, they're the clients of these big multinational agency holding companies. Um, and so for them, you know, figuring out how Procter & Gamble is going to launch a new product across all of Europe is more interesting um, in, in being able to kind of identify that for them in, in a very boring accounting way. It makes their advertising not a, an SG&A line item. It makes it a cost of goods sold. Hmm, yeah, interesting. I that way. Yeah. All right. Listen, I think we need to wrap it up, um, but it's been very interesting. I think you've given us some very interesting insights, and certainly data doesn't have to be the big, scary, big data thing. I mean, it's something that actually can be used and can be used by content makers, and I think the broadcasters have been put on notice that they better figure this new world out. So could you please join me in thanking Ryan Jamberitz? Okay.